And now let's take up the story from survivors of the Titanic themselves. First of all, an American passenger, Miss Edith Russell, traveling first class. Where were you just before it happened, Miss Russell? In the library, the steward had just called out, 11.30, lights out. So I gave him a few letters to post in the morning, told him I'd pay for the stamps, picked up a book and walked forward to my stateroom, which was on the same deck, A11. And as I got in my stateroom, I switched on the electric light and I noticed a slight jar, followed immediately by a second one and a third one, which was quite strong enough to make me hold on to the bedpost. The boat came to a full stop. I walked forward to my window and saw a greyish white mass drifting by. I was very much surprised and decided to take my fur coat and go out on deck and see what it was all about. Well, when I got out on deck, I noticed a gentleman standing by the rail and several people and a large, again, this greyish mass. I said, what on earth is that? That? Well, madam, that's an iceberg. <laughs> iceberg? Well, she said, I've always wanted to see one of those things since I was a child. Well, you're seeing it corker now. There's one-eighth above the water and seven-eighths below. And believe me, that's some iceberg. So, after that, we picked up bits of ice, played snowballs for a little while, and it was very, very cold. I asked one of the officers if there was any danger. He said no, and I went back to bed. As simple as that. No danger as far as you were concerned. No danger. Now, what about Mr. Witter, second-class uh, smoking room steward? What did you think the Titanic had hit, Mr. Witter? Well, I didn't think she'd hit anything. I thought she'd dropped a blade from the propeller, you know. How did you find out what, in fact, had happened? Well, I, well, I went down to the working alleyway where my cabin is. Carpenter came along, and I heard him say, the bloody May room's full of water. I said, what's that ship, May room full of water? He said, yes. I said, well, uh, what about those bulkhead doors forward? He said, they're not holding, Jim. Of course, then I walked into my cabin. I called everybody. I said, come along, fellas, get up. She's going down. I opened my box, took out some matches, some cigarettes, and I said, come on, fellas, get out. What the hell are you talking about? He said, get out of here. And someone threw a boot at me. I said, good night, gentlemen. Just as easy as that. As far as they're concerned, no day driver, not at that time. Well, now, Commander Lightoller, the second officer of the Titanic, died recently, but in 1936 he broadcast his story of that night. It left six compartments open to the sea. The water flowed into the first six compartments forward of number four boiler room and caused her bows to sink so much that the water flowed over the top of the aftermost watertight bulkhead, filled the next compartment, then overflowed again into the next one, and so on. Well, from that moment, as the captain very well realized, nothing could save the Titanic, and the order was given, lower the boats. Quartermaster Rowe, who's here tonight, was a very surprised man. Where were you, Quartermaster? On the poop at eight o'clock. At 10 o'clock, I read the log and passed it onto the fore bridge. At 20 minutes to 12, I was pacing up and down the deck, and I felt a good jar. I thought that was peculiar. I looked along the side, and I saw what I thought was a wind jammer. But as it came astern, I saw it was an iceberg. The engine was going full speed astern then, so I pulled the log in. So I saw a lifeboat being lowered. I reported it to the bridge. They asked me if I knew where the distress rockets were. I said, yes. They said, bring them on the bridge. When Captain Smith saw me bring them up, he told me to fire one and fire one every five or six minutes. After about two or three minutes, he said to me, can you morse? I said, yes, a bit. He said, call that light up, tell her where the Titanic's sinking, please get all your boats ready. She never answered. And that's your strange story for yeah. Master. Just like that. Just like that. Now what about a third class passenger, Mr. Cohen? I think Mr. Cohen, you'd had a bit of a celebration with the boys yes, that night. Yes, I did. <clears throat> we, we had a celebration with, with a glass of lemonade. Am I supposed to believe that? Yes, you are. So my pals do. <laughs> did you get yourself a, a life belt earlier no, on in the proceedings? No, not at the time. The, the reason was because <laughs> we thought the Titanic was unsinkable. When did you really believe at last that uh, she was going down? Uh, when the boat was listing. Uh -huh. And uh, then I decided to find a, a life belt. 
I found it very quickly. And then I went towards the uh, lifeboats. I never had a chance to get in any one of them because the order was women and children first. If this was 11, 19, I was out of it. So I decided to find my own salvation. I went across to the derrick, climbed across the derrick, which was a dangerous thing at Tarni, and went down the rope about 80 feet long and went into the water, into the sea rather. It sounds easy now, quick, doesn't it, when you tell it? Yes, it does, but... I bet you wouldn't like to do it now. No, well, not with this. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether they can see you lower down. I don't think they can, but they can imagine it. Yes. It's not as bad as they may think. Yes. Now, was that lifeboat that picked you up eventually, was it full? No, it was about 25 people in it. The reason it was fairly empty as it was, of course, the people on a boat never realised that the boat would sink. A greater risk leaving the ship than staying That's right, on. yes. Let's ask Miss Russell to take up her story again, and let's jump ahead in time. The last we heard from you, Miss Russell, you were going to bed. You decided to go to bed. Now, let's go forward to the time when you, when you were on deck and you asked Wareham, your steward, to go and find your little pig, your mascot. Would you take it from I there? was in the, on a deck in the lounge when Wareham came along, and I said to him, here, Wareham, are my trunk keys. Would you mind taking care of my trunks if I don't get back in time in the morning? So he said, you better go in and kiss those trunks goodbye. I said, you don't think there's any danger, do you? If there is, all right, you better go back and get my mascot. My mascot was a little pig, a music box. It had been given to me by my mother after a motor accident, fatal to everybody but me in France. So he brought the little pig back. He played the machiche. And after that, I was in the direct line of light from, with Bruce Ismay, who saw me and picked me up like a puppy and threw me down the steps. But I was wearing a sheath dress, very narrow skirt, a long fur coat, a woolen cap, some furs, evening slippers and one thing or another, thin stockings. And I went forward to the rail, looked at that very, very high rail with the lifeboat swinging way out on its davits. And I knew I never could make it, not in that skirt. So as I stood there hesitating, a sailor grabbed this little pig from under my arm and said, well, if you don't want to be saved, we'll save your child. And he threw the pig into the lifeboat. Well, I stood there hesitating, and as I said to a gentleman alongside, should I leave? He said, definitely, madam. Well, I said, can't make it. So now, if you will just sit on my hand, this sailor and I will make a little cradle of our hands. You sit down, put your hand around my neck, and we'll toss you right into the lifeboat. And they did. First thing I did then was to hunt for the little pig. I found it, the bottom of the boat with its legs broken, but it still could play the Matiche, and I played it all night long to keep the children from crying. Thank you, Miss Russell. Well, meantime, the entire crew and all the officers of the Titanic were working frantically. And in the wireless room, the chief radio officer, Jack Phillips, was trying to contact nearby ships. The nearest was the Californian, but her solitary operator had gone to bed. The officer of the, of the watch reported the Titanic's rockets and the disappearance of her lights to the captain, but no action was taken. Meantime, Phillips from the Titanic was sending out the old CQD call, the standard distress signal of those times. But then he changed to SOS the first time it had ever been used at sea. And one of the ships to pick that up was the Carpathia, the captain, Captain Rostrum. Now, Harold Cotton, there he is, was the operator of the Carpathia, and he received the signal. Now, Mr. Cotton, the Titanic called you in distress. What was your reaction? Well, uh, she didn't call me, I, I called her uh -huh. about, about one o'clock in the morning and the only reply I got that she'd struck ice. And I said, was it serious? And she said, yes, this is a CQD old man. Uh, here's the position, report it and get, get here as soon as you can. So I took the position and on a scrap of paper and rushed up to the bridge with it. When I got on the bridge, I contacted the officer of the watch and the information didn't seem as though it had sunk as fast as I thought it ought to, so I rushed down off the down the ladder and, into, uh, and knocked on the captain's cabin, and as I saw a light, I rushed in. And he said, uh, who the hell, or words to that effect. And so I said, well, uh, the, the Titanic struck ice, sir, and she's in distress. I've got the position here. Uh, so he said, well, give it me, and he put a dressing gown on and went. So he said, will you confirm this, go aft and confirm it if you can. Which you did? Yes, which I did. When I came back, he said, well, 
you'd better go back and tell her that we're going to double bank all the watches on deck and below and uh, tell her we're on our way. As and, fast as you could go. Yes, as fast as, as fast as you could go. Fine, thank you, yeah. Mr. Cotton. Yeah. Well, the Carpathia was on its way and back on the Titanic, the last lifeboat got away round about 1.20 in the morning and it had <coughs> over 60 people on board. From the boat, they watched the ship with husbands, relations and friends still aboard, still unable to believe that she was doomed. 